Good morning, guys. Did you guys get sleep? It's like the first day of camp. Everyone looks tired like it's the end of camp. But uh, I hope you guys are ready to jump into the Psalms. Uh, just some few housekeeping things. Last year, I brought candy. I'm going to be honest. I set the bar way too low for all of you. I'm going to change that this year. So tomorrow, I'll bring some like candy and prizes. But here's the thing. Um, if you want to like participate in that, um, I'm going to kind of ask somebody every day, every morning, uh, what we talked about the previous day. And um, then you can get some, you know, whatever I have up here. And if you can recite, if you, if you memorize parts of the scripture that we go over for, the, for different parts of the week, it could be any verse of anything that, I, that we talk about during the week, you can get some candy. All right? Does that sound cool? So starting tomorrow, that's the way it's going to go. And you can refer to me as Batman. You won't get candy for that, though. I just, I mandate that that's what I'm called for the rest of the week. <laughs> I'm just playing. But um, we're going to be jumping into Psalm 2. So get your Bibles. And actually, have you guys done a sword drill before? Have you done sword drills before? All right, so here's the deal. We're going to do a sword drill. You're going to take your Bible... You're going to hold it by the spine. You're going to lift it full extension above your head, full, like locked elbow. All right? Locked elbow. Don't, I see some of you have like the Bible kind of, don't open the, don't, just close it. Full elbow. And I'm going to give you the reference. First person to get to that reference, come up here, speak into the mic and read the psalm for us. Okay? It's all of Psalm chapter two. So here we go. Psalm 2, go. Run, run up here. All right, go for it. What's your name? Joshua. Joshua has the verse. Why do the nations rage? Why do and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart, and cast away their cords from us. Who, he who sits in the heavens is back, the Lord holds them in his derision. Then he will speak to them in his back, and will find them in his fury, saying, After me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell the decree, the Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage. The end of the earth your possession. You shall break them with the rod of iron, and dash them in pieces with the potter's vessel. Now therefore, O king, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry, and he perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all those who take refuge in him. Thank you. Let's clap for that. Great. <clears throat> so, Psalm chapter 2. You may be like, why are, we, why are we in the Psalms this week? Well, like I said, um, when uh, Mr. Bergen asked me to come and speak, uh, and he shared with me just the theme of the verse that you, that's kind of like Chehi theme this, this year um, in 2 Timothy and abiding in God's Word, I think the Psalms just do really well with that. And so we're going to be talking about Psalm 2 this morning. And there's so much that is going on in the world today that I think is a fight for your souls. Uh, I've never been more convinced in all my years in ministry that the culture and the world and the prince of the power of the air really desires to, sh to take you astray, to, to numb you and to kill you. And I don't mean that in like as hyperbole. I, I mean a truly. Like the world desires you to turn away from the righteous and good things and the holy things and to turn towards your own desires and your flesh. And so Psalm 2 uh, talks about this specifically. And uh, there's Joshua, right? Joshua. He read it and he did a great job with it. And so we're just going to go right through <clears throat> all of Psalm 2 together. And this morning, um, so many things you guys are confronted with. 
Um, we're kind of out of the COVID pandemic uh, a little more than we were, and some people are still affected by that. Some people have lost a lot of loved ones. Some people are, have just been affected by different sorts of things. And, you know, I'm not going to sugarcoat any of this for you. You know, everything from race relations to uh, kind of gender ideology and, and um, the LGBTQ movement. And uh, all those things have just affected our society, and, it, and it's fractured us. It's divided us. And um, I think the Lord has a lot to say, and I think um, we were praying with the, with the staff yesterday, uh, Mr. Harry was like, we have so much more um, to be unified under, and that is the Lord Jesus. And, and, and Psalm 2 directly talks about his kingliness, his, his, his kingship over everything. So <clears throat> beginning here, I think Psalm 2 helps us with a number of things as we consider who we are, where the world is, and who is in control of the world, right? It gives us challenging questions today, and that is, where do you and I put our trust in? Who do we put our trust in? Where do we abide in? What do we abide in? Who do we abide in? The psalm is broken up into four stanzas, and it's comprised of 12 verses. And we've just read those together, and I'm going to move through them uh, as fast as I can, uh, because Ms. Lauren said I have like 20 minutes, maybe. And so uh, the psalmist paints for us a picture that we can hopefully be challenged together with. And so if you guys are looking at your Bibles and taking notes, we're going to look at the first stanza, and that's verses 1 to 3. And this is an opposition to the rule of God. The, uh, like, people hate God and his kingliness. They, they don't want him as king. I mean, this even rears its head in our own lives. How's, how's it happen in your life? I know, like, we're, I'm talking like 10 to 14-year-olds. It happens like this. Your parents ask you to take the trash out, and you disrespect them and disobey them and don't do it. Right? Because some of you want to play Fortnite more. Or some of you are gossips and talk about other people that you really don't like. Those are sins. That's opposition to God. The smallest, smallest sin is a, is a direct opposition, a cosmic opposition to the Lord. And so... Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. This is, this is hatred. This is animosity. This is anger, right? This is fear even. Have you guys watched Star Wars? Yeah. Obi-Wan Kenobi just came out. It was awesome. Somehow Obi-Wan Kenobi is an earthbender now, but... It was dope. It was so cool. Anyway, so there's this part in one of the in, in Star Wars where Yoda's like, you know, fear turns to what? Does anyone know the little line? Fear turns to anger. Anger turns to hate. Hate turns to suffering. And I mean, I think this is what the psalmist is trying to like. It's a progression. Like people hate God, and then it ultimately, as we'll see, brings their suffering. When we read this psalm, we read the clear animosity towards God. There is no apathy here. I want to make something clear to you guys. There's no like neutrality zone when it comes to following God and not following God. There's not a middle ground. There's, you're either for God or you're against Him. And so we use all of our amazing gifts, and you guys use your awesome gifts. Um, and I, I said it last year, like, you guys sing louder than a lot of churches do, Right? It's amazing, and you guys have these talents and, and, and these things that you bring to, to the kingdom of God, and, and we use those for, for God. And so there's no neutrality. You, you, you either are for him or you are against him. And we read that later in even the New Testament, in Matthew 12, where Jesus states himself, he who is not with me is against me. And this is the reality here in Psalm 2. What the psalmist is asking is, why is it that people of the world hate God? Why are they so deeply against Him? Well, I think we have to understand the historical background of this psalm. And so, 
it'll become a little clear. This is, this is a psalm that was meant for a coronation of a king. But for my study of this psalm, and I present this to you as well, that if you want to understand the psalm, ask the question, how did the church understand this psalm, the early church? Like the people who like knew this. What is interesting about this psalm is that it's quoted 17 times in the New Testament. We see it quoted in the Gospels. We see it quoted in Acts, Romans, and in Revelation. So to understand the psalm more deeply, you can look at Acts chapter 4, verse 24. If you want to turn there, I'm just going to keep going. And if you remember this story, the apostles Peter and John were taken into custody by the Sanhedrin because of their teaching about Jesus. They were thrown into prison and brought before the council. They were continually threatened and eventually let go. And the believers were praying with them. And we pick up here in verse 24. And they say, when they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father, David. Why do the nations and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed. They're quoting from the second Psalm and immediately gives us a good illustration of people plotting. Indeed. It says uh, a little later in the same uh, Acts chapter. Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against the holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. You here, mortal enemies, the Romans and the Jews together, plot against Jesus. Now, this psalm and the psalmist David is asking, why do they do this? Why so much anger? This only leads to their bonds. If, you, if, if we continue reading, their bonds being busted. Now, what are these bonds? We read that in chap, uh, chapter 2 of Psalm, in verse 3. Now you have to understand who is saying this. A careful reading allows us to see that those who are against God are saying, let us burst their bonds. These are the people that hate God. They said, let us burst their bonds. And cast away their cords from us. These are the bonds of grace. These are the bonds of mercy. These are the bonds of love. Compassion. They're the bonds and cords that connect us to God himself. They want nothing to do with God. Forget God's commands. Forget his connection to us. Forget his laws. And we want to just strike them down. We want to get rid of it in our schools. In all of society, let us put as much distance between us and God as possible. So strike these bonds because, of course, we are so much happier without God. God only spoils our pleasure and happiness in this world. I define who I am, not God's word and God. This is what they're saying here when they say let's burst their bonds. We see this hostility today and against all kinds of things, against the holy things, against God's word. I think it's most clearly seen in, in areas like the LGBTQ movement, where people would run and turn and, and hate others for not like, embracing and then championing something that is a lie for something that is obviously so true. This is, the, this is the quest for a lot of people for freedom. But here's what you guys have to understand. When you go down this road, when you cut your bonds, you think that by cutting the bonds of grace and cutting off these things and, and being so distant that it will make you more free, it actually enslaves you. You become more of a slave. You become less joyful. How can, well, Jared, how can you say that? You become less loving. Well, how can you say that? One of your counselors went over the fruits of the Spirit. I can say that because joy is a fruit of the Spirit. It only comes by the Spirit. J true gospel joy, true godly love. This only comes by the Spirit. 
So you enslave yourselves. You isol- we isolate ourselves when we cut ourselves off from God. And I would wager that many of us, because of all that is happening in the world, do not feel freedom. There's a feeling of fear and of futility and of loneliness and of bondage, evil thoughts, broken communities, broken families, substance abuse and loss of identity. Why do the nations plot in vain? The answer is throughout the Bible. Why do we do this in Paul's description of Christ? He describes the other holiness and kingliness of Jesus, the supreme otherness of Jesus in all creation. At the end of this section, he says this, and you were once alienated and hostile doing evil deeds. This is why we rage against God. And it's so futile. How do I know this? Well, if we look at Acts 4 as a type of commentary from Peter for the second Psalm, we see God's sovereignty. You guys know what sovereignty is? You guys know what sovereignty means? Kind of like holiness. Yeah. It, it's, it's kind of, it's his rule over everything. He knows everything. He rules over everything. He, he's over it all. He knows what's going to happen and he directs things to happen. So all the stuff that happens, and Peter's quote in Psalm 2, and why did the people plot against the Lord? Well, verse 28 tells us, they did what your power and will decided for them to do. God is over it all. That's one of the things we're going to talk about a lot this week. Sovereign, he's over it. He's, he's not confused by the things that are happening. He's not lost by it. He's, it's not like something that he didn't plan for. He was like, you know what? Rian, I didn't see that one coming, bud. That's what he's not saying that. He's saying, this is futile. I know this is gonna happen. And not only did I know this was gonna happen, I'm going to fix it. It's already in play. Nothing you could do is gonna destroy my plan. Do you all see that? Our raging plotting is futile because God is in control of it. And we say. I don't want your rules and regulations. And we rage together and plot, but the Lord responds in this. We read in the second part, verses 4 to 6, the Lord laughs. He who sits in the heavens laughs. From this perspective, the Lord in heaven, all of the raging and plotting is not just futile, it's laughable. He laughs at us. He's like, your sin is nothing in comparison there's this really cool song. I love this song. Uh, I'm the worship pastor at my church. Um, and we sing His Mercy is More. Do you guys know that song? Praise the Lord. That song, His Mercy is so, um, so much more than all of our sin. And, and he, he laughs at it because he's like, there's nothing you could do. Um, my, my mercy, my, my kingliness in, in grace and in love and compassion is endless and boundless. It's deeper than the deepest parts of the ocean and more vast than the universe itself. There's nothing that I'm not in control of or I do not see. Ah, it's laughable. Laughable. This is the gospel, friends. All the raging and all the hostility. He says this. He says, I have set my king on my holy hill. This is the gospel. The gospel is right here on display that God sent his only son in our stead to live and die and raise again because he rules and reigns over all things. How does this affect us today? I can think of a quick application for you guys. I don't know if you have seen this going on, but there's a video and you guys know about the Ukrainian conflict that's been happening, of Ukrainian believers singing in Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian, a song that I sing at my church, and it's called, He Will Hold Me Fast. And it honestly brings me to tears when I see it. And so these guys who literally, people are dying outside their house, bombs are exploding, and these guys are singing, singing these words, for my life he bled and died, Christ will hold me fast. Justice has been satisfied, he will hold, hold me fast. Raised with him to endless life, he will hold me fast till our faith is turned to sight when he comes at last. That 
That, that's, that is the application of the gospel. When we are confronted with many, many things in life and in culture, and when we're confronted with the hostility of man and people who want to burst our bonds, this, he set his king on his holy hill. He sent Jesus for us. And this allows us to walk into any situation and sing these words. What would cause a people to, who face utter destruction and death to say these words? This psalm. The psalmist understood this. The king has been set on the holy hill. And more individually, I would submit to all of you that many, many times in life, we have trouble believing this. We, we have trouble believing this reality. These people are singing for that matter. What we sing and what you guys do this week says a lot about what you believe. Believing those words that we just sung with Be Thou My Vision. This is what the psalm helps us do. This is what the Bible helps us do. This is what it means to abide in God's word, to sing God's word together, to, to be a, in it regularly, to read it, to, to be a part of a church because the king has been set on the holy hill. This psalm directly challenges us to come before the almighty God and submit to his kingship. And more globally, this is a direct confrontational word to all of the idols. You guys are just forming your political opinions and many of your staff and many of your teachers and, and uh, the counselors have, are forming theirs or have formed theirs. And it's a direct, direct confrontational word to our idols, to all the politics of all the mass media, to all the pol political pundits of today, to so much of today's world has been taken up by news. And I think it's a blight. Honestly, I think it's a curse. I say it's a curse because so much division and rage and hostility and hatred has infected not just people who hate God, but the church. Many of you who are just forming your opinions have totally disregarded friends because they are on a different page than you are. It's crazy to me, truly, that nightly we listen to a bunch of people on TV that tell us how the world should be and how the universe functions. And guess what? They always get it wrong. Always. And you know what? They make millions off of it. They make money. And they're successful at it. But this word should unsettle all of us. It should unsettle the kings and the presidents and the dictators and new news personalities and the social media bros and all the professionals and the elites of today. Here's a word for them. That the Lord reigns. Jesus reigns. He's real and he's coming back. That is everything for us. If you're here today and you don't believe that, Talk to somebody because it is real. It is the most real thing you will ever hear that there's a God who came not just to be a nice example. No, to live the life you were unable to, to die and to raise again. And he's been set on this hill to save us. This is our king. This is your king. And this is what we need to be reminded of. Not just as a church, but the whole world needs to hear it. You want direct, more direct application? Share it from the mountaintops that Jesus is king. And he has come in loving compassion to save people who hate him. I mean, they killed him. But that didn't stop him. And so this decree, quickly, I know the teachers are like, yo, you got to hurry this up. This decree, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. Again, guys, this is, this is Jesus in all of his glory. 
This is Jesus in, on full display. This, this is his heritage. This is his people. This, nothing can overturn the reality of who Jesus is. It's his heritage. He has come to save you. He's come to save all who repent and believe in the gospel. Do you guys see this? The psalm is directly the, about Jesus the King. And the prayer that we have been studying right now in this psalm is the, is the coming fruition of the kingdom of God. This is a song. This is a prayer of David. Psalm 2 is all about Jesus, the begotten one of God. We know this reality from all the Bible. Jesus has been set above all earthly powers by God, the Father. The Father sent him to save you and I. This is a good word for believers. But it is a harsh word for those who reject him. It's a warning to the rebels. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled because blessed are all who take refuge in him. Right off the bat, coming out of this kind of heavenly decree of Jesus that he's, all of this is his heritage. All of you, all of the earth is his heritage. He says a word of warning. And what we should do, namely be wise and be warned and serve the Lord with fear and rejoice and trembling. I really wish this is how the state of the union was usually addressed. It would start with all of us giving, giving us all a perspective of the greater reality of Jesus as king. To reorient our minds in such a way that we would be confronted with our own personal hostility to God. And our rage toward God and our ultimate futility. So that we would come into his courts, not with our own works, but with an offering of praise. So that we would come to this God who has saved us in his mercy and rejoice in fear and trembling. I have many friends, and this is true among many of, many of you maybe. And maybe your friends, I have many friends who have apostated from the church. The past few years have not been kind to many of my friends. That means that they claim to be believers and Christians. But then they came and they talked to me and they were like, I'm not a believer anymore. I don't want anything to do with Jesus. I think because they did not like this God of the Bible... And they were won over by a false Jesus instead of the real one. Guys, the Bible is set in the backdrop on the realities of hell and damnation. But that's not, that's not the final word. The final word is that Jesus has been sent to save us from it. But he, he has to save us from something, namely his own wrath. Like complete separation from him. So he says to the rebels, don't rebel against me. It won't be good for you. We see this illustration so clearly in Revelation 6, and this is where I'll end. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone and the slave and the free hid themselves in caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us. And hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne, from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand it? Do you guys, you guys know what's happening here? So Revelation, all these people, rich people, politicians, kings, rulers, you know, poor people, all these people, doesn't matter, indiscriminate, like the Lamb, an angry Lamb. Who's ever seen an angry Lamb? I mean, really, it's weird. But Revelation, John Pace, an angry lamb is coming to cast judgment on these people. And they, they would rather, they, they're literally in a mountain, fall on us. They're, they're yelling at rocks to literally fall on top of them so that they do not have to meet the lamb of God. They would much rather deal with being crushed under the weight of a mountain 
than deal with the coming king. This psalm confronts us with our anger and with our hostility and our futility with a king who has provided a way for all of us. So here's the question. Where do you put your ultimate trust? In what do you abide in? What do you abide in? It's my hope that we can say with the psalmist, I abide and I find refuge in the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we just come before you and we thank you for the gift of your son. We thank you that uh, this psalm is just, uh, just a direct confrontation to us that we um, are challenged by it challenged by the words of David. I pray that um, you would just help these guys with all their, their work this week and uh, just to have fun, uh, but also just to hone their craft and, and to make it uh, so much gloriously better for your glory and honor and praise. In your name, amen. Thank you, guys.